That was a lot. You want to close there? Have a good Sunday. Welcome to One Two Church. I'm Pastor Matt. It's good to be back. Good, good, good to be back. I want to thank Alan. I see you. Uh, how many of you liked last week? Wasn't that great? Yes. Amazing. Amazing. Um, I was sitting at a house in Washington just in tears at how good our God is and, and how powerfully he spoke through my brother. Um, we are in a sermon series of getting personal with God. And this, this is not to be redundant, but this is personal to me. Um, it was a weird trip. It was a weird trip. I, I had a lot of thoughts going through my head. Um, it's another one of those where I have zero idea the direction of the sermon today. So if it's horrible, sorry, just blame it on jet lag. So we, uh, I was gone for a week in Washington. And there was a lot of times where I sat and I pondered about my relationship with God. And what we've been doing is we've been uncovering the religion versus relationship and how religion says you need to do, you have to do certain things. Relationship, it has, it's already been done. And some people look at God as a, you know, it's an imprint on history. He changed the way that we, we look at everything. He changed the way time exists where every time we sign a check, we're acknowledging the fact that Jesus lived. It's a historical fact that Jesus lived. The tomb was empty. But some of us still think, man, he is so far away. He's a million miles away. I, I just want him to be right here. I want him to be with me. And I did some, uh, I did some studying. I, w I was curious about the statistics of Christianity in the world. So th this, this surprised me. Now, I want to clarify, I, I have no power to determine if you are saved or not. And when you take your last breath, you're going to be with Jesus. I have no judgment towards that to be like, you know what, you're not. Now, now we can see the fruits of what comes when Jesus comes in our life and the change that happens. But these statistics... They don't make sense to me. Just in America alone, there are 380,000 churches. And the last survey that was taken, there are 73% of Americans that claim to be Christian. Think of this, 73%. Now I'm talking, I'm talking about every denomination that holds Christ as God. 73% of Americans say, Jesus is this, and I'm a Christian. Globally, a third of the population globally claims the name of Christ. Something doesn't add up to me, church. Can you imagine if you have a piece of meat that you're ready to smoke, and you add a third a third cup of seasoning and salt because the Bible says we're supposed to be the salt of the earth. Can you imagine how flavorful that piece of meat would be? And I look at the world today and I'm wondering if we have 73% of America claiming to be Christ, why are we in the, the position that we're in? Why is there so much hatred? Why is there so much bigotry? Why is there so much argument? What, 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 what is happening here? Now, now I want to preface again. I'm not saying these people are liars. I'm not saying that they aren't saved. But look at these verses. As I read these statistics and I look at these verses, let's go to the first one. I, I don't remember which one it was. Whatever's first on that screen. This is how unprepared I am and, and relying on the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's get personal. Pretty sure it's in uh, the Bible somewhere, New Testament. 
Like, don't you have this memorized? No, there's a lot of books and a lot of words in the Bible. Is it not working? Okay, this is this is awkward. Um, there we we almost had it. I really should have written down these verses too. That's the funny part. I sent them to to Brandy, and I know she's watching online. Love you, Brandy. Thank you for doing our slides. Um, hey, Crystal, can you read me the the uh, just the passage, and I'll read it from the book here. That's a good one. Matthew seven thirteen through fourteen. If you want to follow along while they work on this. So I read these statistics and then I look at the word of God and it says, enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many, many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Now, 73%. 73%. But this Bible tells me that only a few will find it. And it also says, oh, there we go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frank. Hey, everyone get Frank a hand. This, this building... This area is possible because of Frank. So only a few find it. Now we go to the next one. As we read, the, as I'm studying, a third of the global population are saying that they are, they are Christians, that they believe in Christ. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, now listen, the first week that we talked, we talked about the difference between religion and relationship. Right now, they're saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? They're talking about works here. Did we not work for you, God? Did we not do things that pleased you, God? Did we not do the things that we thought would, would ensure that we got close to you? Then I will tell them plainly, plainly, I never knew you. I was, uh, I had an interesting experience from the very start of my trip. So I wanted to spend as much time with my bride as possible before go going on this flight. I knew it would be a week away from her. I don't like it. Her birthday is, is Tuesday. She, uh, for, for two more days, I can say that I'm married to a 39 year old and it feels really good. <laughs> Just give me your age. I'm going to be married to a 39 year old for like 40, 50 more years. So that's okay. But I, I had this interesting experience where I, I was a little early. Brownsville, you don't have to get there very early in order to check in. It's not like Sacramento, Seattle, these major airports that, that I usually fly out of where you can just show up and you just walk right through and you walk on the plane. So we're driving by and I see my favorite thing in the world is authentic Mexican food. And God was like, you know what? You've been faithful to me. I'm going to reward you by moving you to a place that has some real authentic Mexican food. <laughs> but we drive by this place that had bars on all the windows and it said open. And it was, it was legit authentic Mexican food. So I told Crystal, we're stopping. I want to eat with you before we get on the plane. So we eat. And I rush to get there because I'm a little bit behind schedule. And I think I'm going to be a little late. And I get there and uh, I'm looking at the screen as I'm sitting there for the gate. And the time keeps changing of when we're going to take off. And I said, well, I have a three hour delay in Dallas, so we should be good until that time kept changing and kept changing and kept changing. And then I asked the ticket agent, listen, here's my connecting flight. Here's the time. And she said, well, you should barely make it. It should be okay. I'm not going to change you to another later flight because if you make it on time, you should be fine. And I don't want to remove you from that. 
So I said, all right. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to mention the name of the airline because of the story that, we're, that I'm going into. And maybe there'll be a sponsor of One Two Church one day. But, but I, uh, I sit down on, uh, in the, uh, the 49th state. No one knows their history here. So this flight, probably named after the 49th state, I sit down and we get there and I realize I'm looking at my time and we're on the we're on the tarmac. Dallas, the Fort Dallas Fort Worth, the airport, it's like it's a city. My goodness. I was thinking I'll, I'll be fine. I get on that little train that, that goes and goes and goes and goes and I But before I before we uh, get off of the plane, she said the, the lady gets on the intercom and says, uh, there's five people that need to get off first. If you can be courteous and allow these five people to get off so they can make their connecting flight. And my name was mentioned. I'm like, praise Jesus. I don't have to. What, what is it? I don't, I don't. Someone explain this to me at some point. Not right now. But why does everyone feel like as soon as that plane lands, they have to stand up? We're all leaving. Like we're all leaving in line. And you stand up and you're getting your baggage out and it's hitting people in the back of the head who are sitting waiting patiently for their turn. But anyways, that's a, that's a rant for later. And what and why here? This is going to be a rantful day. Why? Why? When when your group number is called, why why does everyone have to rush to the front to get on the plane when we're all leaving at the same time and you have a seat already scheduled for you? It's not like you're going to miss anything. So just sit down and enjoy. Okay, just enjoy and then just walk on and there's your seat. But anyways, the, this guy stands up and he grabs his bag and he's just, he's just standing there. And this lady just said, can you please be courteous and five, allow five people, these five people to go. And I'm two rows behind this guy and he's just in the middle standing. So I walk up to him, pastorly thing to do. And I grab his shoulders and move him to the side, and I go by. And I get on the train, and I'm rushing to my gate, only to find out that I missed my flight, and the guy that I moved <laughs> was on that flight, and his name was called, but I just happened to move him and get out of the way. So I let him go first. They rescheduled me on a, a, a later flight, but here's the problem. I, I'm tall, and I, whenever I fly, I try to spend a little extra money to get the upgraded seats with more leg room just because it's more comfortable, especially on a four and a half hour flight from Dallas to Seattle. Well, since they rescheduled me, I lost my seat. And so the seat that they sat me in, picture this. I have no idea what this has to do with the sermon, but I'm going to rain just a little bit because I haven't even shared this with my wife. But I'm sitting here. First class is right in front of me. And I have a middle seat. I don't, I don't like middle seats. I paid for a window seat and I paid for up front, up there. Okay, because I, I've flown enough that they upgrade me, which is nice. But I'm, I'm one of only two seats that as I'm sitting here, I'm the only one that can see directly down the path of first class because there's two seats in front of me and I have the aisle. The rest of the people behind me have something right, right there. So mine is just blank. And I'm watching these people with their fancy glasses and their, their real towels that they're giving out. And the lady that pulls this little fake curtain so that we can't enter into this little area that they're, that they're in. And I have these uh, noise canceling headphones. Before I leave, I said, I forgot my charger. I push the button, it says fully charged, great. Half an hour into my flight, it says uh, low, low battery, shuts off. So now I have to listen to their conversations, the, the first class, the, the place where I should be. I should be there. I did everything right to be there. And they're talking. They're probably talking about moving money in the Cayman Islands. All, all this fancy stuff that they're talking about. Right? Four and a half hours. And if you're in that seat, there is no tray table that comes down in front of you 
because I don't have a seat in front of me. I'm just looking at all the fancy people in the seats that the seat that I should have. It's right there and there's no tray table. So the tray table comes up out of the armchair and folds over. Now here's the problem. The bathroom for the first class, I can't use because they put that little curtain up and I'm not allowed to enter into there. I'm not allowed to enter into the spot that I paid for. I can't go in there because they moved my flight. I have to go all the way back to the end of the airport. Now you guys are like, oh, poor guy. No, just let me get through this, okay? <laughs> About two hours into the flight, I realized I have to go to the bathroom. The only problem is the lady who's sitting by me has fallen asleep and she's leaning on me and also leaning on where my, my tray table would go that I would have to fold back in to go to the bathroom. So I'm like, I, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I can't listen to anything. I can't do anything. I'm just watching about the life that I should be having for four and a half hours. And then about an hour before we land, this first class passenger, because they got the, they have the fancy like big armrests, right? It's wide armrests. They can put all their fancy cutlery all over the, the spot. She moves her arm and knocks her bottle of water straight back and it lands on my backpack with everything in it. And I can't do anything about it, church. I can't move the, the tray table because the lady's there. I don't want to disturb her. So I'm just watching this water drain into my backpack and I'm like, this is going to, this is going to be a good trip. We get off and the 49th state tells me, you don't have a flight anywhere else. Did you even get on a plane to get here? And I'm thinking, no, I just showed up right in the terminal and we're going on. They said, you don't have a ticket because when they moved you, they deleted you from the entire system. And these words, these words stuck with me. He looks at me and he said, I want you to know you're lucky. A family didn't show up. And I'm like, don't tell me. Don't tell me that I'm lucky when this is not none of my fault. Right? None of my fault. They also, side note, deleted me from returning home as well. Everything was gone. It's like I didn't even exist in their system. So have you ever felt like you're not good enough? Have you ever felt like you've done everything that you can, but life in front of you is it seems to be going on as usual and it's positive and you're sitting back and you're thinking, I've done everything I could, God. Like there was not one problem except for maybe physically moving the guy. I shouldn't have done that. I let him go in front of me and ironically, he got the seat in first class, blah, 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 and I didn't because I moved him. I should have just waited and then beat him on the little train thing. But, <laughs> but have you ever felt like you don't measure up? Have you ever felt like there's this chaos in your life that's happening and you look at this other area of your life and you're like, man, that, why can't that be me? God, haven't I served you? Like, haven't, haven't I done everything that you've asked me to do? Which brings us to the passage we have today. So it says, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish, Jewish festivals. There's three Jewish festivals per year that, that Jesus, we know, would have gone to every single one with his mom. That, that was what you did. You would go. It says, now there's in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in, in Aramaic is called Bethesda. When I read this, California people, I say Modesto. But there's no, there, there needs to be a lot of healing in Modesto, okay? Which is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Now, some versions will say in chapter, or in verse 4, if you notice it's not in some of the newer translation, verse 4 says, it was rumored it was rumored that an angel would come down and stir the waters of this pool. And the first people in that pool after the angel came down and stirred it would be healed from this, from the blindness, the lameness, paralyzed. 
One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. 30, picture this. 38 years of him right there. 38 years, unable to move. Three times a year, all these people going in and getting healed. I, I, I look at that and I'm like, where, where's the empathy? You want to talk about being salt of the earth? And how the earth should change by the amount of people who claim the name of Christ? Don't you think that at some point when somebody was healed and they would have noticed in 38 years that this guy wasn't getting any better. They're like, well, I'm healed. Let me help him into the pool. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Now, Jesus knows, right? He's not just asking this question to, to try to understand why he's sitting. He knows. He says, do you want to get well? This guy doesn't respond to that. What he does is make an excuse. He says, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. Now, this is important. 38 years, so I'm a numbers guy. When I, when I look at numbers in the Bible, I think, okay, what does that mean? 38, three plus eight is 11. 38 itself, there, there's little reference to it. Three plus eight is, is 11. 11 is the number of chaos in the Bible. So look at this scene where you have three times a year, and this is historical, not biblical, Historical. This pool exists. The, the things that happened at this pool started when Jesus was born. And the stirring stopped when Jesus died and was resurrected. Now, this is, this is Matt talking, right? I just wonder if Jesus going to this festivals would just take his finger like kids do, right? And stir the pool. Three times a year, these people come in and get healed. But it is such chaos in this person's life. Think of this. For 38 years, you have three chances per year. Someone do the math. I don't know what it is. 114, something like that. 124. 38 years, three times, this man is trying to get to what he thinks heals him. He's sitting there and all of a sudden as the water is stirred, I don't, the, the angel, Jesus, whatever, that water is stirred and the first people inside that pool get healed. So only the elite, those who are quick enough, those who are fast enough, will be healed and for 38 years this man can do nothing about it. Now the reason that I bring up my, my airport story is because as I was sitting there I was like, I wonder if this is just a portion of how that man felt. Of you did a you rush, you did everything, you tried to beat people in line, you had, you, you had to, you, I did everything that I could, but I couldn't get to the pool. I couldn't get to the spot that I thought I was promised. Now, what does this pool represent? This pool represents religion. Only the, the elite, those who do enough, those who are quick enough, can gain the healing. I, don't, I want to know the backstory of this guy. Somebody had to drop him off by the pool and let him know this is what's going to change your life. If you can just get to the pool, this could just, just change your life. And I'm wondering, I just wonder how many people have been sitting in church, sitting in religion for decades thinking this is what's going to save me. And we read a verse earlier where Jesus will say, you said my name. But depart from me, I never knew you. 
And how many people do we have sitting next to that pool Sunday after Sunday after Sunday thinking this is going to be the spot that heals me? And I want to ask, would Jesus be welcomed in your church? So if he came to die for religion, the laws, would he be welcome in your church? Because Jesus doesn't participate in our pools, church. You saw this, that he's waiting. This man is waiting to be healed from the pool. And all of a sudden, this man, this Savior, seeks him out and he asks him a question. Do you want to be well? And his excuse is, I've been here for 38 years and there's no one that will help me get into the pool. And I'm wondering how many Christians today are sitting by the pool wondering, why haven't I been healed? Why hasn't this chaos all around me subsided? Why don't I feel the fruits of the Spirit deep within my soul? Why don't I feel like God is as close to me as a brother? Why don't I feel that Jesus is living within me? I've done it. I've gone to church. I've done all the steps. But where's the change? Where's the healing? 38 years I've been in this position and I can't do anything about it. Somebody dropped me off at church and they said, this church is going to change your life. And every Sunday I go and I'm there for an hour and I go home and nothing about my week has been changed. But I'm going by that pool and I'm sitting there and I'm waiting and I'm just wondering, when is this chaos going to subside? And I want to let you know that Jesus has no interest in participating in your pools. He is all about personal interaction, one-on-one -on -one relationship with that person. Where he's like, do you want the pool to heal you? Or do you want me to heal you? And paralyzed keeps coming to my, to my mind. And I want you to know, church, that for 20 years I was paralyzed in religion. I couldn't do anything about it, is what I thought. I thought I was doing the right thing. I'm just sitting by this pool, and that's what's going to help me. That's what's going to save me. That's what's going to free me. And for 20 years I was sitting there. But I, I need you to know, church, that there is a danger of sitting by that pool. Why? We just read it. Depart from me, I never knew you is one of the scariest phrases that I ever could hear. Depart from me, I never knew you. So going through all of these, these works, these traditions, these customs, of going through a different person to gain forgiveness. And I've done it. I've done the steps. I've done everything I can. And then I get to the end of my days. And Jesus looks at me and says, you said all the right things that you thought you were going to, you needed to say. You prophesied in my name. Called down miracles. But I didn't know you. I didn't know you. Apart from me. And I'll admit as a pastor, for so long I was trying to get people into the pool. I was saying, just, you know, let's just go to the pool. Here's the steps. Let's, let's be healed. Until I realized that it was never the pool that healed me, it was the person. You know the reason behind our leadership team? It's not the elite. It's not those who go throughout the, the week talking about how great they are. The reason behind our leadership team is because of their brokenness and their admittance to the brokenness 
and how they would be lost without the person, not the pool. I am not interested in having anyone serve a one, two church that just wants to be at the pool and do things at the pool. But it says, do you want to be well? And I want to ask you this. How long are you going to wait by the pool thinking it's those who are quick enough that will be healed and will be saved? Salvation, hear me. Salvation has to be as real to you as it was these new legs for this man. Because it says, can we go back to that, the start of that story? I want you to see how salvation works. Okay, one more slide over. This is how salvation works. Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured. Do you see anywhere in here where if you're not walking for 38 years, the atrophy that has to set into your legs, it doesn't once say that the new tendons came, the new muscles came, that it was built up and it was strong. And then he was kind of wobbly like Bambi. And then he stood up and he's like, whoa, I got it. It says at once the man was cured. I want you to know today that at once Jesus can save you. And when he saves you, he saves you all the way. All the way. It's not, I'm going to save you to a point, and then you sit by the pool and direct other people to the pool. It's at once, at once. This, this is personal. But then we go to the end of the story. So he's healed. He's walking around. He's got his mat, and he's like, oh my goodness, look at these legs. 38 years, now I can walk. This is amazing. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Now this, this angers me, church. I'll be honest with you. It angers me because this is, this is how a lot of churches work. They would rather keep up the rules, traditions, and the Sabbath than celebrate the healing of a broken person. This man, they, they've known this man. These Jewish leaders have known this man. They may have even have thrown him a few coins as they walked by so that he could eat. And they see him and immediately, it isn't a celebration of this new life, of this man who's now able to walk that never was able to walk. They said, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow? Who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea for who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said, said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Oh, how pastors have used this verse to crush people. You've been saved. I, I grew up in religion. You know this. I grew up in a religion that when you get baptized at eight years old, that's that's the cleansing of you. And then every time you sit after that, the uh, the onus is on you to be able to get rid of that sin. That's what I was taught. And so we have pastors who are saying now that you are healed man, you can't trip up, you can't slip up. You can't, no, 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 no. You look at the original meaning and, and scripture interprets scripture. So you look at what this means and what it means is I have healed you physically, but what I've come for is your soul. I've healed your body, but what I really want is the spiritual healing. That's what I came for. Follow me. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who made him well. This is wild to me because because of this verse, if you, we don't have it, but it goes on a few verses later. It says, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. It's amazing to me, church. It crushes me. You want, to be, you want to be honest about it? We are holding up religion and not celebrating the healing of people. We are more concerned about rules and regulations and keeping up appearances than it is going after the lost and the broken. And that's what they're doing here. 
That's what they're doing. They're like, 38 years you're walking, that's cool, but it's the wrong day. It's the wrong day. You can't do that today. Maybe tomorrow you can do it. It's cool that you can do that. But no, they're saying you need to lay back down. This is the Sabbath. You've got to lay back down. We got to keep up these rules. You got to lay back down. We have a third of the population claiming to be Christ. But I wonder how many are so worried about keeping up rules that they're missing the person. That they're sitting by the pool, but they're missing the person. This man didn't know Jesus. You notice that? He didn't know Jesus. He was like some guy came to me and said, pick up your mat and walk. And all of a sudden I'm healed completely and I can walk. Now, there are some people in this room and those watching online that you have recently committed your life to Christ. And for that, I'm, I'm shouting from the rooftops. I was in Washington and I had the question over and over again, how is it going? And I was like overwhelmingly beautiful. And I can tell you story after story after story, if you have time, about the personal healing. Now, I want, I want to comfort some of you here today. How quickly these spiritual watchdogs come out after this guy who was recently healed and changed. For 38 years, they ignored him, right? All of a sudden, Christ changed him, and they, they start, he starts to get attacked. So I want to comfort someone in here. I, it's just, I don't even have notes, but I, I want to comfort someone today. Maybe you've given your life to Christ recently and you're like, why are all these attacks coming? What's going on? Like I thought that once I followed Jesus and I have this healing, why all of a sudden, I was left alone for 38 years, but all of a sudden in one moment, in one day, I have this religious guard dogs coming after me and saying, don't do this. I want you to know That a dog doesn't chase parked cars. And Satan doesn't kick a dead dog. So if you were doing something right for Jesus, you were going to get the attacks. You were going to have the people coming after you. You were going to have people saying, no, I've seen your life. I've seen your life, Matt. All of a sudden now you're this Jesus boy. And uh, no, well, I'm, gonna, I'm looking at that. And I'm like, no, no. Jesus has healed me. He has healed me. But I want to ask, are you struggling since Jesus? He did this on purpose, church. He did this on the Sabbath on purpose to send a message that this healing, this personal interaction, this relationship with me is way more important than any rules that you have made. And by the way, this wasn't in the Torah or in the, this rule of not carrying your mat on the Sabbath. This was made up by these people in order for them to feel elite. This was made up. It's not scripture that you're not supposed to take up your manual. They made this up, but they came after them. He has new legs. And now he's not even welcome. But I love how this guy doesn't fight back. He's like, this guy told me to stand up and walk. So I'm walking. What, what, you guys didn't pay attention to me for 38 years, what are you gonna do? Take away my church membership? Can't do anything about it. Like I'm healed and I'm healed by the only one that could heal me. I didn't get to that. Do you know he never got to the pool? Jesus didn't take his hand and carry him to the pool. Jesus healed him. And what's awesome about this is Jesus is the living water. He's not the pool that's stirred up. He is the living water. Because one chapter before this, he meets the woman at the well and said, you'll thirst no more if you come to me. And it's no coincidence that one chapter later, there's some water there that people think that's what's going to heal me. And he's like, you came, from true, came for true healing? This is where the true healing is. It's through me. And I want to keep breaking the rules. I do, church. I do, because it's not the rules that'll save you. It's not the pool that'll save you. It's him. From my flight from Seattle to Walla Walla, 
when they deleted me from the system, they said it was lucky that I made man and should be on the planet. On my ticket, it was near the front because I just I just like to get off, right? Just confine the plane. I, I love flying, but when I'm done, I'm done. I, let me get off. But they moved me all the way back to 27B. And it was fine, but as these small little prop planes go, the farther back you go, the closer the seats get together and the, the lower the, the headrest. So I'm like this, knees in. And I was like, man, why am I in this spot in my life? And I wanna to talk to someone here today. Maybe you are in that spot in life where you're like, God, why am I in 27B? Why am I in 27B? This man for 38 years must have been wondering, why am I in 27B? I've done it. I've, I've tried, no one will help me. I've done everything I can. I can't do anything more. But at some point, church, I want you to ask yourself or listen to God where I had the moment of clarity that said, maybe I'm here, I'm back here for 27A, for 27C, for 27D. Maybe I'm in this position in my life, not for an upgrade, but for the people that are around me. And I had that clarity where, man, Jesus comes to him and he says, stop singing. And I asked him, man, what does that mean? Do I just, do I stop smoking, cussing, drinking, and hanging out with girls and do? Is that what I do, God? Is that, is that what I'm supposed to do? And he's like, no, I came for your soul. Follow me. And at times I wonder, am I going to get healed? Follow me, son. Am I going to be well known? Follow me. Am I going to make all the money that I want to? Follow me. Am I going to be famous like I, like I want to be? Follow me. Is it going to be tough? Follow me. Is it going to hurt? Follow me, son. Is it going to be painful? Follow me. But this, this mat, not this mat, this map that this guy is carrying. And that's his testimony, isn't it? For 38 years I sat on this and I'm not letting it go. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold it so people know. How did you get from laying on that thing to where you're at now? And they say, let me tell you about a man that I met that healed me completely. It wasn't a stage-by-stage -stage process, church. It was completely. But I've been asked, why do you share your darkness so much? And I say, that's the map that I'm carrying. It's a testimony of who he is, not who I am. And I've been asked by family, friends, hey, can you calm down about this Jesus thing? And I say, I... I can't. This is all I got, church. This is all I got. I can't lay back down. I can't lay back down on that mat. I was nothing on that mat. I was, a, I was an addict. I was an alcoholic. Overdose to suicide. All of that. That mat that I carry not only represents the old life that I have, but the, came, the man who came into my life and changed everything. So excuse me if I don't mind carrying around this mat till the rest of my life. Where I want to show people this is my Jesus. And I want to, I want to, I want to prod some of you. Do you want to get personal with Jesus? Talk to him about your mat. Talk to him about what you're struggling with. Have a, have a deep personal relationship. And then after you're healed, don't stop sharing that story. That, that is glorifying Jesus. 
And I tell people, this is what my hero did. This is what my hero did. For 29 years, I was on that mat and I couldn't do anything. But sometimes we see rules more than broken, hurting people. Church, I want you to know, I'm gonna keep breaking the rules to get to people. I am. People say that, that you can't watch church at home in your pajamas. Yeah, the, the, this church is now represented in 13 different countries. And we've been here 11 months. God is using this as a tool. God is using this as a tool. And you may ask, you're like, how do you disciple those people? It's called the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moves in them through us and we're able to talk. I'm not doing this to fill buildings or to, or to get people in the pool. I'm, I'm doing this for people who say, I'm so broken, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to get into that pool. I don't know if I'll ever be the cool, the elite, the quick enough. But all I know is this man walked in my direction and he told me to pick up your mat and walk and follow me. And the reason we're not given his name, we don't have a name, church, of this lame man. The reason we don't, we're not given a name is because that man is you. And that man is me. And it's, supposed, it's because we're supposed to see ourselves in him. I'm tired by this pool, church, I am. I am tired by this pool, thinking it's the quickest, the fastest, the elite, those who don't do everything right. The, the surest thing you can be assured of is he's going to come to you and wrap his arms around you, and he's never going to leave you. And what I realized at the end of that flight is, Nate, you want to come up? Someone's got to stop me. But what I realized when I got off that flight was it didn't matter how quickly I forgot who was sitting where. Do you know that? Sure, I was back in 27B, but when we were in the terminal, I couldn't have pinpointed who was sitting where. It was all about the destination. And what I want from you is I have two questions, and I need, I need some, some name music for these two questions. I, ha I have two questions for you as as we close church. The first one, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? That's not a choice I can make for you. That's not a choice that anyone can make but just you. And I want you to seriously consider and ask yourself, do you want to get well? Because you have, should have seen my life before I got well, before I met the man of my dreams, before the one who, the, the lover of my soul that saved everything. You should have seen me before Jesus where, man, I'm tired. I couldn't get to that pathetic pool hoping I would get lucky and get healed by being in church week after week after week. It was going to the man, not going to the man, but the man coming to me. And then in turn, he's saying, follow me, follow me. But he gave me a choice. With love comes choice. And he asked me the question, do you want to get well? Follow me. But the second thing that I want to ask you is, what's your pool? What is your pool? For some people, it's religion. For some people, it's fame. For some people, it's career. For some people, it's money. I'm saying, if I just attain this, then I will be good in life. If I just own enough of these, I will be good in my life. If I just attend church enough times, I will be good in my life. What is your pool? Because I want everyone here to know it is not about the pool. It is about the living water that will cause you to never thirst again. And what does that mean? When you go into heaven after following him and, and doing away with any pool that takes place of Jesus. Any pool can be anything that is rising above Jesus. Or what is the first thing you think of in the morning? 
What is the thing you strive after? What is the thing that you, you try so hard to get to? Is it Jesus or is it the pool? And if it's the pool, please this week identify what is my pool? Because I don't want any part of any pathetic pools, church. I want the man who changed me. Because when I get to heaven, what I want to hear is you didn't get you didn't strive and fight and push people aside to get into that pool thinking you could be healed here on this earth. And, and you got the money, you got the career, you got the fame. And you, but you didn't know me. What I want is to say, you wanted to get well. You followed me. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Welcome home. I want a welcome home, not a I never knew you. And salvation is as easy as this of saying yes to Jesus and immediately salvation is here for you. And I want to offer every single person here watching online, reach out to me if you say yesterday, but I want to pray right here that, that we move away from pools and we say yes to Jesus. Father, we love you. Father, we are so blessed and encouraged to know that and no matter how long we've been at the side of that pool trying to strive, thinking that we're doing everything right, but there's chaos around us. So we try a little bit harder. But Father, you walked into our life. You disrupted this man's life and changed it forever. And I'm asking, Lord, for those here who are wondering, who are wishing that they would get to, to be well, to get to your well, the living well, that today is the day that they say yes to this, that they get personal with you, that they tell you about the mat that they've been sitting on for decades, that you are the only one to say, pick that up, use it as a testimony and move forward. That Father, the Bible says that you believe in, in your heart and speak with your lips that Jesus is God, that he is king, that I want to be well, that you don't have to have it all figured out, but you just saying yes to Jesus and doing the right next step with him, of just moving with him, wherever he turns, you turn with him, your eyes are on him, that you want to say yes to Jesus with all eyes closed. This is a private moment. I want you to shoot up your hands so I can pray for you. Who wants this? Yes, yes, yes. God, you are so good. I thank you for every hand raised in this building, those watching online, Lord, and thank you for being the living water where we can do away with the pools just like it was done away with when you rose again from that grave and you gifted us with the Holy Spirit. Lord, let us be the salt on this earth and let there be a difference when we walk by and people may see the mat that we carry, but we can always point to you. Let that be the church. In Jesus' name, amen.